So somebody comes in and, uh, you know, they, they get the tax bill from John and, uh, you know, all of a sudden they, they clasp their chest. Now, tell me, what do you folks know about a heart attack? What does it look like, folks? What, are they, what is the patient telling you about? What are they, what are they saying? They got chest pain, right? Okay. And they, they can describe this chest pain as a heaviness or a sharp pain, and it's usually high in a scale. Uh, in EMS, we use a scale of 1 to 10, and usually they're up in the 7, 8 range anyway when they have a chest pain. Some of the other significance of the chest pain is it radiates into their arm, their jaw, their back. Uh, they also may have shortness of breath. They may have some nausea. Uh, their skin color might become gray or pale. And maybe they have a heart condition to begin with, or maybe... They didn't know they had one, and now they do. Uh, we want you to recognize these signs and symptoms. Because if you can recognize those signs and symptoms, and you give us a call, we can come and we can take care of them long before their heart stops beating. Because that's often. Once their heart stops beating, folks, uh, they have a chance of survival, but they have a much better chance of survival if we can catch it before that happens. All right? Everybody good with that? Yeah. Um, so we want you to recognize that. Uh, you may have somebody that comes to you that might uh, appear intoxicated. Okay, they're slurring their speech, they got a fruity odor on their breath or something like that. What do you suppose that might be? Diabetic. Could be a diabetic type of thing. So ask them, are you a diabetic? And then, you know, you can get uh, maybe a candy bar from, from you or something like that. Uh, you know, if they can swallow it, have them take that, do that kind of thing. Uh, you might have somebody that has a seizure disorder, and they may drop to the ground and have a seizure. Sometimes a seizure can be just kind of like staring out into space, like a couple of you are doing right now, <laughs> all right, uh, and, and not really make a whole lot of sense, you know, like the lights are on but nobody's home, that type of thing. Uh, but we, I, I bring these things up to you because you may encounter them. Somebody that comes to you, they may see this or the library, or the transfer station, or any other place as a way of getting help, and they come to you and they, they, uh, they need that kind of help. You give us a call, we come, and uh, we'll take care of them. Let's get back to CPR a little bit. CPR is the one thing that, that really can make a dramatic difference in somebody's life. Uh, we have taken CPR now to a level where uh, the training is very simple. The person just kind of pumps on the chest, and just keeps going over that, and uh, that keeps the brain oxygenated. So by the time we get there, we have something to work with. Okay. Once the heart stops beating, folks, brain stops getting oxygen, and we need the oxygen in our brain for it to function. Without the brain, nothing else works. So uh, by us doing CPR, what we're doing is we're circulating blood throughout the body, keep the brain alive. So. Somebody collapses in front of you, and you don't know what's going on. The first thing we want you to do is we want you to grab a hold of them and shake them and ask them, are you okay? okay? And I mean, you don't have to be too gentle about it. You, know, you go up, <laughs> hey, you all right? 
okay? I know Josh. I've known him for years since you were about that high. Um, anyway, um, you do that. Shout. Talk to them. See if they respond. If they don't respond, what do you think the next step should be? Give me a call, okay? It's job security for me, folks, really. All right? But we do, we, we want to get started here. We want to be early into this. We, want, we don't want to waste a whole lot of time. Then, while you're waiting for me, okay, we want you to start CPR on this person if you can't detect a pulse. Where do you find a pulse on a person, folks? Up in the neck, okay? So, take a second, if you would, please. Right next to your windpipe, you should feel a pulse on either side of your throat, okay? If you don't have a pulse, you shouldn't have signed in, okay? <laughs> All right. So that's what we're looking for. Now, if you can't find that pulse, then start CPR. Now, it's a pretty simple process these days, folks. We've taken out the secret handshake. Anybody can do it. Little kids are learning it. And what we want you to do is we want you to put your hand right in the middle of their chest, right down here, just below the nipple line. Yes, Chief, I said that word. All right. <laughs> right below the nipple line, right in the center of the chest, and you're going to push down on their chest. You want to do this about 100 times per minute. Okay, that's the rate you're going to be doing. Okay? So it's kind of fast. About two per second. The beat that we use, uh, for some of the old folks, I'm looking around the room, uh, staying alive, okay? Bring that. All right? So, yeah, okay, all right. So, yeah. Uh, all right, it's not another one bites the dust, okay? Don't use that song. All right, so we have to record it that way. I keep forgetting. All right, um, anyway, so we're going to do that. You're, you're going to do this about 30 times, and then if you have a mask, and we have masks in the first aid kits, you are going to blow into their mouth, okay? That's what we're going to do. We're going to start that process. Um, and okay, we're that. great guys. All right, so now somebody has gotten the, the uh, AED out of the cabinet. We have AEDs throughout the whole town. We have them in the library, we have one in the hallway here, we have one at Pendle, um, we have them on our ambulances, we have them in all our fire trucks. Uh, some of the cruisers in town have them, I don't know all of them that do. Uh, and the way they work, folks, is they're going to give an electric charge to the heart to try to jumpstart it. Not all cardiac arrests are a, a rhythm that we're going to shock, but uh, the vast majority are. So what we want you to do is we want you to start CPR. We want you to circulate blood throughout the whole body. You're going to be pushing on that chest 30 times, two breaths, 30 times, two breaths, in a rate of about 100 per minute. And then now somebody comes along and they got the AED out of the cabinet. Now, I want to just take a second and show you that two things are in the cabinet. The AED itself and this yellow packet. In this yellow packet is uh, a little razor. So if you've got like cro man, okay, around the room there, yeah. Okay, uh, you, you may have to shave a chest to get these pads to stick, okay? Uh, so that's in there. There's also gloves. Uh, there's also you know, very small directions on the front there. It's pretty simple stuff, guys. Um, and uh, you're gonna, so you need both things to work. Um, so if somebody grabs that, we're going to take the clothes off, okay? Just rip the, the shirt off, uh, take it up over the head. Whatever you've got to do, get that off. You need it gone. If they're wet, you're going to dry them off as well. So you can use. Uh, their clothes or something to just kind of dry the area you want to put the stickers. There are on the uh, pads themselves, there's another one of those pictograms, okay? We use those a lot, no one up in the top here. Uh, and uh, you're going to peel the package out. One patch is going to go up here, another patch is going to go down here. Okay? Pretty simple. I'm going to pass this around so you can take a look at it. Please don't open it. Um, so you're going to put these pads on. Once you've done that, there's a wire inside that package that's attached to them, and that's going to go right up to this top part, right up in here. Okay? Now this machine, you turn it on, this little green button, okay, green, usually means on, uh, and it's going to analyze the patient. 
So while it's analyzing the patient, we don't want you to touch them. We don't want you to do CPR. We don't want you to even touch them because if it recognizes a shockable rhythm, it's going to charge up and it's going to ask you to push this flashing orange button at the bottom. When you push this orange button, we want to make sure that you and nobody else is touching the patient. Because remember, this is sending an electrical charge through their heart, correct? And if you're touching them, that electrical charge could go through you too. Now we got two patients. Get some more pads. Um, so be, please be careful of that. The other thing is, if they have uh, jewelry, you know, like a, a big net, you know, the Mr. T star set, okay? <laughs> you want to remove that too because we know that electricity and metal means welding, okay? And that's, that's not good for the patient. So try not to uh, try not to have that as well. Once the AED has analyzed and it says to shock them, you shock them, and then go right back into the chest compressions, okay? Because it's going to want you to do that for two more minutes before it analyzes again. Hopefully by then, we're going to come screaming around the corner and help you, okay? Now, it wait, might wait, take... Wait, wait, wait. Yes? You, you, after it gives them the shock, yes. you start in giving them... Compressions again. Yeah. Yes. How long do you do it? For two more minutes, and then it's going to analyze again. Does it give you a warning? Yes, it will. It, it has it has a voice prompt. This good question. It does have a voice prompt as well uh, as a little screen, as, uh, so you'll hear it. It will okay. tell you that. I, I'll show you with the trainer what that sounds. Like. Okay. Now, you might be having to do CPR for a little while, folks. If we're tied up at Maine Medical Center with our lead ambulance, and we don't have anybody else to send you. It might be Wyndham, New Gloucester, Raymond, uh, North Yarmouth. It could be any one of those folks coming in here to help us. So they have a little ways to go. Likewise, we do the same. We go to Wyndham quite often. Uh, we've gone to New, uh, New Gloucester quite often as well uh, to help them. So if you have to do CPR, it, it may not be just a couple minutes. It might be a little while. So what do you do? Well, you have other folks to help you. Maybe you've been doing CPR now, it's been a few minutes, your back's starting to get a little sore. Have somebody else come in and take over and do it for you. And it's pretty simple. Just kind of take that second just to check, see if you find a pulse, no pulse. The second person comes in and just kind of continues right along that process. Okay. And again, there's no secret uh, handshake or decoder ring or anything like that. So that's the CPR thing. How many breaths do you give them? Two. 30 compressions, two breaths. 30 compressions, two breaths. Just keep going along that way. You're going to compress down a couple inches on the chest, and um, you're going to circulate the blood throughout the whole body and do that kind of thing. Um, My question. Yeah. You said after the first round, go right back to CPI. After the first AED. Well, that. Well, the AED, it will time for two minutes. No, but say the, the first shock, if that happens to bring the person back, mm -hmm. will that tell you that you don't need to be doing CPR? No, it won't. Okay. It will tell you to check the patient. Okay. Immediately after it shocks the patient, it will tell you to check the patient. And if the patient's talking to you, you probably don't have to do compressions. <laughs> uh, you know, the break is over, time to go back to work. Uh, the other thing is, folks, this, uh, this only recognizes a couple shockable types of rhythms. There are other types of uh, heart rhythms that um, will cause cardiac arrest where the heart starts beating. It won't shock them. If that happens, a voice prompt will come on here and it will say, if no pulse, continue CPR. Okay? but it will not shock the patient. Okay. These things have fail safes in them. So if I was to hook it up to somebody that already has a pulse, but I maybe couldn't find it or something like that, it will not shock them. It won't shock somebody that is, uh, you know, you see in the movies and stuff when somebody dies in the hospital, they go flatline. That doesn't happen right off, folks. It really doesn't, okay? That's a long time. When we see the flatline, 
you know, the bets are off. It's, it, it's a long, it's been, they've been down a long time. This will not shock them, contrary to what the movies do, okay? Um, again, it's just, uh, that's the movies. So, um, I do want to uh, point out one thing before we go on about these maintenance flies. We check these once a month. We go around. Uh, Chris and, and uh, Nick uh, go around and, and make sure these are all right. We do have a seal on the boxes. All that seal does is it makes sure that we know that nobody's tampered with it. All the equipment that's supposed to be in it is in it, uh, so it, it's ready to be used. The one thing that you folks can do to help us is to make sure that there's nothing in the way of the, the uh, AED box so it's, it's readily available. Trash cans, tables, stuff like that's out of the way. The other thing is, up on the upper uh, left-hand side, right-hand side uh, of the thing, is a little hourglass up in here. I'll, I'll walk down through so you can see that. That is flashing all the time. If you see a red X in there, that can't be good, right? So you give me a call. We'll fix it. Uh, but if, if the hourglass is flashing, what this is doing is it's doing a self-analysis. does it continuously. It's telling us that it's ready to be used uh, if it has to be used. So uh, don't turn it on. Just kind of pass it around, please. And uh, you can see what I'm talking about about that as well. Mike? Yes? Um, concerning that, when they, when they go into low battery alarm, mm -hmm. we've had that a couple times, will we still get a shock out of that? Yes, you will. Yep. Yeah. It has an, it, it, it may not be a full uh, power, full capacity, but it, it will be able to charge up enough to shock somebody several times. If the low battery alarm goes off on that and, and it shows low battery or whatever else, give me a call. We'll order a new battery, we'll put it in, and you're good to go again. Okay, but um, uh, the, the batteries on these things are supposed to last a couple of years. So they, they get a long shelf life here. All right. So I brought in uh, a trainer uh, AED. This works the same way as that one. It just might look a little differently. So we've started CPR. Somebody's doing chest compressions on the patient. They're circulating blood throughout the body. The brain's getting oxygen. That's great. Now this thing comes. That's a good thing for us. Because if we can shock that heart and get it started again, we can stop doing compressions. Okay? So, well, again, we're going to bear the chest. We want to make sure that we can get the stick, uh, the uh, pads on them, uh, and dry them off if you need to, and everything else. Open the device up, and uh, this thing has uh, these electrodes. And <clears throat> again, even the trainer has the pictograms on them that shows where the, the electrodes go. One upper right, one lower left. And once we do that, the machine will start doing analy uh, analyzing the patient. We have batteries in this hole. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> All right. Okay. Shows up and they're doing this and they're doing, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This, this, like I said, this, this is the training one. get the pads on. Once that's done, then again, don't touch the patient. Let it do its thing. If you're doing compression while this is trying to analyze the patient, it will screw it up. So what it will do is say, no, we're not going to shock you. Okay? So we want it to be able to recognize the shock. All right. So 
That's kind of the CPI thing. I'm gonna, they're going to change the batteries out on that, and hopefully it will be working for us. In the meantime, let's talk about some more first aid stuff. Now, when, when I think about uh, you know this group and what you need for first aid, public works. You know, you guys are working around the heavy machinery. You're working about sharp objects, that type of thing. You guys have been around long enough to know pretty much what to do and everything else. Bleeding control. Okay, bleeding control is, is one of the quick things you can do. Just a you know a piece of gauze or something like that. Put it over whatever's cut and just hold it in place, right? Um, Mania Mess is, is now using tourniquets now. Again, they come back into vogue uh, where we're, we're using tourniquets to control uh, blood loss. Uh, we don't put those on paper cuts, okay? Only on really significant types of cuts where we may have an arterial bleed or that type of thing. Uh, if you do have to use a tourniquet to control bleeding, folks, we want it to be something wide, like a wide belt or something like that. Don't use a cord or something like that because that can actually cut into the skin itself and uh, it, uh, it can do more damage. If you do have to use a tourniquet, we want it to be as close to the wound as possible and uh, we want you to record what time that you put the tourniquet on. I'm sorry. Bear with me. Okay. You're not the first one to say you don't like what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> anyway. One of the things that we do. Did you get a break, bud? Okay. You just got to try. Anyway. One of the things that we do to record the time is we write it on the patient. Okay. We actually write the time on the patient. Because if you write it on a piece of paper and it doesn't go to the hospital, nobody knows what time that tourniquet went off. Is a pretty good chance that if you write it on something on them, it's going to go to the hospital with them. Okay, so uh, make sure your pen works first. Don't just keep trying to, you know. But anyway, so we do that. Um, 911 obviously is going to get us there, or or some sort of EMS uh, service or, or fire apparatus. Somebody's going to come and help you. But in the meantime, we want you to be able to to uh, to do that. You know? All right. Okay. Well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, seizure activity and uh, diabetic uh, emergencies, that type of thing. One of the other things that we talk about uh, when we're talking about CPR is choking. Okay, and what we're just reminding me of what Barbara just brought in. Uh, anyway, people choke. And uh, what we want to do is we want to try to relieve the airway of somebody that may be choking. And how do we recognize that somebody's choking, folks? Beautiful. Yes. All right. The books, the books in the, the movies will... I heard that. From a Cubs fan. All right, um, this, this doesn't work. I can tell you I've been doing this for almost 40 years, and everybody I've seen a choke hasn't done this. <laughs> All right? Uh, what they usually will do is they'll quickly jump up out of their chair and run through the bathroom. Now, it may not be that they're choking. It may be something else that's urgent. But for the most part, that's what people will do. So. We tell people, if you are choking, do this. Because a lot of folks are trained in CPR and everything else and recognize this as a universal sign of choking. So, uh, you know, if you're a Cowboys fan, you know, this, this is good. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, that recognized. So, somebody's choking. We see this, or we recognize somebody's choking. What do we want to do to them, folks? Ask if they're choking. Okay. So we're gonna we're going to go through the motions of somebody choking. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna first ask them, are you choking? Joe, come on up here, buddy. Me? Yeah, you. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, they'll save your ice cream. They won't eat it for you, buddy. All right. So say he just got his ice cream and it went down the wrong pipe. And uh, he might be choking. Okay, I'm gonna go up. And I'm gonna say, Are you choking? 
Now, if he can speak, if he can make any sort of noise, he's not joking. But let's just say for the sake of argument, he's not able to speak. He's going like this. He looks like he's joking. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. All right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to come between his feet with mine. Okay, I'll get to that in just a minute. I am going to find his belly button, which is right above his belt. Okay? Unless he's a skate rat. You know, pants are down here. Yeah, I'm not freezing. All right. But I'm going to be right here, and I'm going to squeeze inward and upward really hard against him to try to get the dog to go. Thanks, sure. Because good sport. Okay. Um, Inward and upward, inward and upward, and you are going to bruise internal organs. You are going to try to force internal organs up against the air trapped in the lungs and get that object to come up. The way this, this, the principle is pretty simple. If you took a balloon, fill it with air, put a cork on the end of the balloon and squeeze the balloon, what's going to happen to the cork? It's going to come up. That's what we're trying to do with this person's uh, abdomen. We're trying to squeeze everything out and try to force that object out. Now, my foot was between his. The reason for that is it gives me good support. If he passes out because I'm not able to get that object out, he will pass out. Now he can just slide down in front of me and I can support him without him taking me down too. All right? So that's how we do the Heimlich maneuver. Everybody's heard of it, right? Dr. Heimlich actually vacations in England. Okay, I don't know around there. Yeah. So anyway, that's Heimlich maneuver. Any questions on that? All right. You can also do the Heimlich maneuver to yourself. Okay, you're at home, you're having a hot dog, all of a sudden, boom, goes the wrong way. Uh, you can do the Heimlich maneuver to yourself. You can stand there and you can just force your, force, uh, your fist into your uh, abdomen, or you can use the back of a chair or that type of thing and just kind of force the air out. You can call 911, but guess what, folks? You can't talk. But we still want you to call 911 because they can trace the line. They will send a cruiser. State law says that if anybody calls 911 and there's nobody on the other end of the line, they will send a cruiser to find out if you're okay. All right? And a question, Doug? Uh, kids, so when my son was two, I remember he was choking. I put my legs up this way, put his head down this way, yep. face down, and hit his back. Yep. And I just lodged it, and he was right. right so. Two year olds are, are at a, a kind of a, 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 an age where that will work for them. Once, once the child gets up over the age of eight, then we start to use adult techniques. But for kids, yes, uh, we've done. Uh, back blows and, and abdominal thrust and kind of alternating between the two. Yeah. But works. Yes? What if they've already passed out and they're laying on the floor? Then what we're going to do is go right into our CPR sequence where we're going to do chest compressions. Okay? And again, by doing chest compressions, that is going to uh, make the lungs work like bellows and try to force that object down. Oh, okay. Okay? We used to do abdominal thrust and kind of back and forth. Now they just keep it really simple. If you have an unresponsive person, they go down, you do chest compressions. Okay. Any other questions on that stuff, folks? How's your good? Good. good? All right. She takes good care of us. She really does. Um, all right. Um, Mike? Yes? What is it for? What should you be doing with children? Under eight. Under eight? For CPR, what we're going to do is they're going to probably be in our arms. We're going to use the force of one hand on their chest to do the compressions rather than, you know, forcefully doing it uh, with two hands like we do with an adult. And you're still going to do, you know, like 30 to 2. You're, it's going to be a fast rate. You can also do it on a tabletop. But again, we're going to just use our, our fingers and just kind of push in. You only have to push down about half an inch to three quarters of an inch in depth on the chest. Oh, up to one eight. Up to about eight, yeah, approximately. Some kids, some eight-year-olds are bigger and smaller, you know, but that's kind of the average that we use. Okay. Any other questions on any of that stuff? We're just kind of firing it out at you. I know, again, this is a review for some folks, chance to ask some questions uh, and that type of thing. Um, we talked about seizures, talked about diabetes, we talked about cuts. Um, anything else that you folks have encountered before? Yes, we're not going to have a counter, but do you, if someone's having a stroke, do you... Um, All right, I was
was going to get to that, but let's start right here. Okay. So strokes. Uh, there has been a lot of publicity recently on uh, strokes. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but uh, we want you to recognize the signs of stroke. Uh, what happens with a stroke is a blood vessel that supplies the heart, uh, the brain with uh, oxygen, is either clogged or has burst. One of those two things. What will, how the person will present is they'll have slurred speech. They may have a facial droop where one side of the face is lower than the other. Uh, they may not be able to use an arm or leg. One side of them will be uh, not able to be uh, used at all, that type of thing. Um, we want to recognize the signs of stroke. We want to be called. We're going to take care of them. Um, and uh, in some cases, if it's a blockage, uh, they can give them medication at the hospital that will help resolve that blockage, and uh, they have a pretty good prognosis. If it's a burst blood, uh, burst blood vessel, then uh, they sometimes have to have surgery to correct it. But again, there's been a lot of uh, uh, great treatments uh, uh, for stroke uh, recently. Uh, so we want you to recognize stroke. The person may uh, be not able to communicate with you. They may kind of be staring off into space. Uh, if you talk to them, if you notice that there is a facial droop, that type of thing, then it could be a stroke that they have. People also have what they call a transient uh, type of stroke called TIA, which is there right now. It's kind of a spasm, if you will, of that blood vessel. And then after a, a few minutes, uh, it goes away and they've got, they're, they're back to normal. Everything's great. Still need to be treated, still need to be evaluated, but uh, it, that can also happen as well. Um, but again, we want you to try to recognize uh, when, when something like that is going on and recognize, call 911 so we can get started and we can take care of that. We're going to give them oxygen, we're going to put on a cardiac monitor and start IVs and all kinds of other things for treatment. Um, but a uh, good question to, to ask. Uh, we see strokes in all ages, too. Uh, a friend of my daughter uh, has uh, had a stroke. Uh, a young lady, probably about five years ago, had a stroke in her 30s. So uh, it can happen at any age, and uh, she's had a good recovery, by the way. Um, uh, anyway, question, any other questions on, on anything like that? Sunstroke or sun exhaustion or heat exhaustion, that type of thing. This is the time of year we start thinking about that thing. You you know, the Parks and Rec folks, you're going to have kids uh, running around doing, you know, kid stuff. Uh, so good question to start with. Um, on hot index days, where it's really humid and uh, sun's really bright, kids particularly, also the elderly, are susceptible to heat uh, type of emergencies. Uh, kids don't know enough to get out of the heat. They don't know, you know, they're playing, they have fun, okay? Um, some of the elderly, the uh, mechanisms in their body to regulate heat don't work as well. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, they, they're in an apartment or, or a home where they may not have air conditioning, they got the windows all down, that type of thing, and uh, it's just really hot in that thing, and they, and they don't move, they, they don't have the mobility to, to move well. So we look for that type of thing. How do we recognize it? Well. Uh, if they're really sweaty and they're really pale, uh, they may feel lightheaded or they might even have a, a fainting type of spell, uh, that could be heat exhaustion. They also sometimes have nausea along with that. It's all part of, of the symptoms that we see with heat stroke. So if you see that, what we want you to do is, first of all, get them into a cool area if you can. Get them into the shade, get them into some air conditioning, that type of thing. We don't want you to have them chugging a whole bunch of water at first. Little sips of water is okay, but not a whole bunch at once. Remember that nausea thing that they got? Yeah, that can be an issue. So we want you to just kind of cool them down. Give us a call. Glad to come over, take a look at them, evaluate whether they need to be going to the hospital or not. Uh, but we want you to cool them down, and we want you to, uh, again, give them little sips of water. Um, now, conversely, if a person's been out in the sun and now they're not cold and sweaty and, and really they're hot and dry, that's a real life-threatening emergency. All right, that 
that is when we need to be called and we need to take action really quickly to get this person hospital because their ability to cool the body down is gone. We cool our bodies by sweating uh, and, and uh, that type of thing. Now they don't have any sweat in their body to, uh, to cool themselves down and they need to go to the hospital. Uh, hopefully it gets to that, but uh, again, we sometimes see that on, on little kids and uh, for uh, older folks that uh, may not be around a whole lot uh, to, to look at. So this is that time of year we start looking at that type of thing. Uh, the other thing that we see with the Fox and Rex folks uh, that are here is uh, you know, they're at the beach and uh, you know, they're going swimming. Uh, we look for drowning. Uh, I hope uh, we, we've had a really good uh, track record. Uh, we hope this year is, is uh, no exception. But for drowning, what we want you to do is get them into safety and we want you to start administering CPR. We're going to come, we're going to take care of them. Uh, and, and get them off to the hospital. Even if you're able to revive them and everything's uh, you know, good there, we're still gonna bring them to the hospital and get them checked out. Uh, but we want you to do it safely. Your lifeguards should be trained to be able to get the person in safely without endangering themselves. Uh, if somebody's way out in the middle of the lake, give us a call anyway, we've got boats, we have ways of getting to people safely, so you know, we don't wanna put anybody at risk. Uh, and uh, get them in and, and uh, start taking care of them, all right? Um, insects uh, things, okay? Uh, you know, folks in, uh, in, you know, Ed's crew, you know, you know uh, trimming hedges and that type of thing, and uh, you know, you, you hit a hornet's nest, uh, it happens. <laughs> wow. uh, some folks are highly allergic to bee stings. Uh, some folks aren't. Some people don't even know that they may be allergic to bees until they get stung. Uh, so, how do you deal with that? Well, when a bee stings you, uh, the stinger is stuck into your skin and there's a venomous sac that's attached to the bee. Uh, we don't want you to just grab a hold of the thing and just pull it out because when you do that, you're actually taking the venomous sac and you're actually squeezing it and putting the venom into your body. Bad day. So, what we want you to do instead is take uh, like a credit card or, or a sheet of uh, paper or something like that and just kind of uh, slide it against the, the stinger and that will take the stinger out of the body without squeezing that sac. Uh, now, how do you treat the person that may be having an allergic reaction to a bee sting? Some folks that know that they have a reaction to a bee sting will carry an EpiPen, this is epinephrine. It's in a self-administering type of uh, uh, device. And what they do is they'll take the device, they take the safety cap off, and they jab it into their thigh. You may be able to help them do that, folks. And what it does is it pumps epinephrine uh, uh, into the body and uh, combats the shock that they have from the bee sting. If you have to help them do that, you don't have to bear any skin or anything like that. It goes right through the clothing, right into the thigh, good meaty muscular area, uh, right into the thigh, and hold it there in the thigh for about 10 seconds to allow that medication to get into the bloodstream. Give us a call, okay? They may need a second dose, which we can give. Uh, they probably will need a trip to the hospital. Again, we can give that. Uh, but uh, these people can go into shock. Somebody with an allergic reaction to bees can go into shock. Now, shock is the body is kind of shut down and uh, they may pass out. Uh, they may have difficulty breathing and all that type of thing. So what we want you to do with that person while you're waiting on us is we want you to, you know, to, if they're, if they're wearing a, a collar, we want you to loosen the collar. We want you to get them to lay down, elevate their feet up. Okay, and that helps to try to get some of the blood from their legs up into the core, trying to get that blood pressure to stay where it's supposed to be. Try to combat the shock. Keep them warm, keep them dry, keep them calm if you can. Um, and again, we're going to be coming. Um, we take it very seriously, okay? As much as I like to joke around in these classes and everything else, uh, the bee sting is a very uh, serious thing. Worst bee sting I ever seen in my career was a lady was eating a sandwich. Want to take a bite? Bee stung her on the tongue. Uh, that was the first time I ever did a crike, okay? Uh, but anyway, she's alive, she's doing well. Uh, but anyway, uh, bee stings, uh, something you'll see. Now, you may be asked, uh, for the folks in the Fox and Rec, 
You can have a kid that's allergic to bee stings, and they got their own EpiPen, that's cool. But now another kid gets stung by a bee, and they don't have an EpiPen. They're not prescribed an EpiPen, they don't have it. Do not use the other kids, okay? Just wear a caution. Epinephrine can cause the heart to beat really fast. Uh, if they don't beat it, it can do some damage to them. So we want to be cautious about using that. Only use it for the patient who's prescribed. The other thing about these epi kits is sometimes they come with Benadryl. Uh, Benadryl will also help uh, take care of the histamines that the body is, is uh, putting into the system to try to get rid of the bee sting, the bee venom. Uh, and it's okay to give them that. It's just be a couple of chewable tablets uh, to do that. But be aware of it. You know, uh, I know you guys at Fox and Rec do a great job. They really do uh, with getting that information from the parents and everything else. And just know your kids. Right. Now you've got uh, go kits, right? Uh, when you take the kids uh, down to wherever or whatever else, you've got a kit that you carry with you. It's got first aid stuff, contact information, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. all right. I'm sure it's all current on that. All right. Any other questions, guys? We're towards the end of what I'm going to do, and we're going to get out of here pretty soon.